attendees are trickling into the room. Uh, welcome to the uh, kickoff panel for Expanding Empathy um, 2024. Uh, this is the first of three sessions we're going to have virtually uh, this year. Um, this is this panel is the sixth year we've done Expanding Empathy. Uh, we've started off in person back in 2019, and um, yeah, that does make it six years, right? So yeah, this is it's been fun to watch it evolve. Um, this year, much like in prior years, we are uh, having panels in which we're bringing together psychologists and philosophers to each present their work and talk about uh, points of complementarity, divergence in terms of how they approach their work, um, and various topics relating to empathy and morality. Uh, this is hosted through the Consortium on Moral Decision Making that I run here at Penn State, uh, which is supported by the College of Liberal Arts, the Department of Philosophy, uh, the Social Science Research Institute, the McCourtney Institute for Democracy, the Rock Ethics Institute. I think that's all of them. Um, but we're very gracious for their support. Uh, and yeah, I'm excited by the panel we brought together today. I mean, the broader the broader theme of this year's three panels is how we can think about empathy and other moral emotions and other moral processes in terms of conflict and change. And I think this first panel is especially exciting because I think there's three experts who all are coming at this question through a, a really interesting a set of perspectives and methods. So the format, um, for those of you who are new to this, uh, well, basically we'll have three talks uh, sort of back to back, about 15, 20 minutes-ish for each one. Um, if you have questions in the audience, uh, please just drop them in the chat function, the, or sorry, the, the Q&A function um, at the very bottom of the Zoom webinar there, and I'll try to curate them. Um, probably the easiest thing to do, you know, leave some questions there if, as they come to mind, but we'll try to take a few questions after each spe uh, speaker's talk. And then we'll save about the last 45 minutes or so for just some general conversation so one of the most exciting things about these panels is getting people together to talk to each other and see what kind of naturally emerges from that. And so the last um, you know, third to half of this is going to be that conversation. And we'll take additional questions from the audience then too. All right. So um, Kira, Felipe, and Aran, thank you for being here. Um, we'll go ahead and get started with uh, Dr. Sakira Hudson. Uh, let me go ahead and introduce her. Um, She's an assistant professor at University of California, Berkeley, the Haas School of Business and the Management of Organizations Group, where she runs the, the Higher Lab. Uh, she completed her doctoral degree in psychology at Harvard uh, under Dr. Jim Sedanius, Mazri Banaji, and Mina Sakara. And she uh, completed a postdoctoral fellowship at Yale University with Dr. Jennifer Richardson and Michael Krauss. A lot of her work focuses on hierarchies, uh, empathy, counter-empathy, prejudice, and motivated reasoning. Um, she's rece uh, received several awards, including the SPSB Sage Emerging Scholar Award, an NSF SBE Postdoctoral Fellowship, and has published in many of the field's top journals like Nature, Perspectives in Psych Science, and Social Psychological and Personality Science. Um, I think the topic of empathy and counter-empathy is especially relevant where we are you know, right now with an election coming up and for various other reasons. And so, yeah, whenever you're ready, uh, Kiara, take it away. And good morning, everyone, or at least uh, in the Bay, it's definitely morning for me. Uh, and I also feel like the youngin in the group, so I'm pretty excited for, for this. So uh, today I'm gonna talk about uh, Schadenfreude's role in intergroup conflicts. Okay, yeah. Um, and so I'm gonna situate my presentation today on the psychology of emotions in intergroup contexts, and I'm gonna initially focus on empathy. So empathy is often hailed as an emotion to target in intergroup conflicts because it predicts consequential pro social behaviors that can reduce inequality. And in many social conflicts, people struggle to feel empathy for those not a part of their social groups. So in 2006, Barack Obama coined this phenomenon as society's empathy deficit. And what he asserted was that uh, there's a lot of talk in this country about the federal deficit, but he really wanted us to talk about the lack of our ability to put ourselves in someone else's shoes. And what he's putting forth is the argument that the main barrier to intergroup cohesion and harmony is the lack of empathy that we feel towards others. Now, giving away the punchline of this talk, what I'm going to argue in this presentation is that while empathy is relevant for pro-social and helpful behaviors, it might not uh, be able to adequately explain why people harm members of other groups. So in my work, I've developed a model that offers a more nuanced perspective 
proposing that we need to incorporate a second understudied emotion, namely schadenfreude, to understand people's more nasty and harmful behaviors. So schadenfreude is what happens when people feel good at another person's pain, and it is likely, uh, especially likely to manifest when group dynamics are competitive. So what I am going to focus on is what schadenfreude's role is in conflict. And the first thing I'm going to argue is that schadenfreude is not just this passive emotion that doesn't lead to any behavior. So that's the current understanding of schadenfreude. But instead argue that it actually can lead to not only support for, but also engagement in intergroup harm. And then the second thing I'm going to argue is that schadenfreude can help us explain the relationship between people's ideologies or worldviews and the harm that, they, uh, that those worldviews can lead to. So there's a lot of work supporting the connection between worldviews and group-based harm. And I'm arguing that schadenfreude is an important mediator of that relationship. Okay, so let's uh, talk about this model. So at the center of my model are emotions, which is probably not, not surprising. So as we know, emotions are powerful predictors of intergroup behavior, and one of the most well-studied emotions in intergroup context is empathy. And while empathy is a multifaceted concept, here I'm going to focus on the affective component of intergroup empathy, and I'm going to define that to be the congruent emotional reaction a person feels in response to the assumed emotional state of another. So in the case of a group misfortune, people who are watching this group misfortune, people who are feeling sadness in response to that misfortune would be experiencing uh, affective empathy. Now, the reason why empathy is so well studied in intergroup conflicts is because uh, it uh, is tends to be lower, uh, sorry, in um, spaces of conflict. So people are less likely to feel empathy for those who they, they don't consider an outgroup, or sorry, an in-group. But feeling empathy is related to a whole bunch of pro-social behaviors, such as donating time and money to people in need, as well as engaging in costly altruism. Thus, uh, many interventions aimed at reducing intergroup conflicts focus on increasing empathy uh, that people feel towards outgroups because that then increases the tendency for them to engage in pro-social behaviors. But we know though, right, that intergroup conflicts are not just maintained by people not helping one another. I wish that was true. They're also maintained by outgroup harm, things like active subjugation, dehumanization, and genocide. And if empathy was the full story, what we would expect is that outgroup empathy would simultaneously produce an increase in group help and a decrease in outgroup harm. However, there's a surprisingly small correlation between feeling empathy and engaging in aggressive behaviors in general, suggesting that the lack of empathy is not necessarily sufficient for this type of intergroup violence. It might be sufficient for things like intergroup avoidance and neglect, but not the harm. So there is probably a negative relationship, but it's probably pretty unique. And so in situations of violent and often protracted intergroup conflicts, not only do individuals fail to adopt the emotional response of relevant outgroup members, but they also adopt the opposite response. Uh, they experience counter empathy. And you can see why I'm placing sort of empathy and counter empathy together to nuance our, our understanding. And so counter empathy is when you feel the emotional response that is incongruent and opposite that uh, of another individual. And there are two types of counter empathy. So we can feel schadenfreude or feeling positively in response to another person's pain and glutschmerz or feeling negatively about another person's pleasure. And hopefully, uh, if there's any Germans in the room that I pronounced those two words right. So for this talk, I'm gonna focus on schadenfreude because it is a counter empathic emotion in response to a group's misfortune. So as you can imagine, schadenfreude is kind of nasty, right? It's this like nasty, spiteful emotion that is especially likely uh, to come online in competitive settings and many intergroup conflicts are marked by competition and threat. But more importantly for this model, feeling good at another person's pain might be the very emotional response necessary uh, and to get to group harm. So some previous work by my mentor and collaborator, Nina Takara, she's theorized that schadenfreude might be this gateway emotion for intergroup violence as feeling schadenfreude towards members of outgroups sort of activates the reward circuitry in the brain. So in other words, feeling good is a rewarding emotion, but the problem with schadenfreude is that is that good feeling is at the expense of another group. And so what I'm arguing is that engaging in intergroup outcomes that deliberately harm outgroups through acts of commission, active hate, and subjugation requires not only the absence of empathy, but also the presence of antipathy or schadenfreude. Okay, so hopefully all of this makes sense thus far. So now the question is what leads people to feel these emotions or not? 
And there's a lot of literature out there. And so when I looked at it and I synthesized across it, what it felt like uh, was that perceived group threat was a powerful antecedent of intergroup uh, emotions in general and empathy and schadenfreude specifically. And it probably is not surprising uh, given everything that I've talked about thus far, the more that an individual perceives a group threat, the less likely that they'll feel empathy and thus less likely to help them. And the more likely that, that they would feel schadenfreude and thus more likely to harm them. Now, the last part of the model outlines the context and the individual differences that can either exacerbate or mitigate perceived group threat. And for the sake of time, uh, I'm going to focus on one individual difference in particular that reflects a chronic competitive threat-based way of seeing group dynamics, which is SDL. So to give you a bit more background on SDL and why I think it's very useful to study in the context of intergroup conflict, we have social dominance orientation, or SDL measures the extent to which people accept and promote group-based inequality, right? So people with relatively higher levels of SDO, what they do is that they care about maintaining a current social hierarchy and believe that some groups should be at the top of the hierarchy and others at the bottom. And perhaps not surprisingly, SEO is positively related to a whole bunch of prejudicial attitudes like racism, sexism, and xenophobia. And it's also positively related to endorsing policies and behaviors that support inequality, like torture and anti-affirmative action and unequal resource distribution across groups. And so people with relatively higher levels of SDO, they should be feeling these emotions and engaging behaviors that keep marginalization intact. So feeling reduced empathy and increased schadenfreude uh, in response to outgroups and low status groups pain and engaging in less helping and more harming behaviors as a result is very much so in line with the overall worldview or ideology of SDO. And we measure SDO by measuring people's agreements to statements that are extremely face valid. Things like, to what extent do you agree that an ideal society requires some groups to be at the top of the hierarchy and others at the bottom? So here's our model overall. And so in the second part of this talk, what I'm going to go over in a very high level way are five findings that collectively show why schadenfreude is relevant to intergroup conflict. So this is taken from my work. And so the first three findings are going to center the connection between ideology and emotions. And the second two, or sorry, excuse me, the last two findings are going to focus on the full pathway of ideology, emotions, and behavior. So in my earliest work, what I did was investigate just the basic relationship between SDO, empathy, and counter-empathy in an intergroup context. And so to do that, what I did was have white participants indicate how much empathy and counter-empathy they felt in response to racial in-group members and out-group members. So I employed what I'm calling the state empathy task. And so on a given trial in this task, participants saw a person and a story. So this is George and George stepped his toe. And for about nine trials, these stories were mildly negative, as in this example. And what we did was ask people to indicate how good and how bad this story made them feel on 100-point sliders. Uh, and this indicates, uh, or this uh, constitutes our measures of empathy and schadenfreude. And so to make this an intergroup task, again, all of the participants in this study were white, but they responded to stories about white, Asian, and Black men. And so what uh, I'm going to do is show this relationship between SDO and how much emotions that people felt. SDO is on the x-axis, how much emotions people are feeling is on the y-axis, and we have empathy and schadenfreude. And the lines here represent the relationship between SDO and a given emotion for a particular race. And what we found was that when group boundaries are highlighted in a very competitive way, individuals who are higher in SDO, they show reductions in empathy, but actually only for outgroup targets, only for the Black and Asian targets. We also found that race-moderated schadenfreude. So as SDO increased, these white participants were feeling schadenfreude towards all targets, but especially Black and Asian ones. And we replicated uh, this finding with novel groups. Uh, so this is about four studies uh, that we did in, in this line. So that's my finding one, that there's a basic relationship between SEO, empathy, and counter empathy. In this next set of studies, what I wanted to do was test this idea that people with higher levels of SDO are motivated in their emotions, that they actually want to feel less empathy and more schadenfreude, but now towards low status groups. Now we're expanding uh, sort of the, the groups in question. And so to test this, all I did was give participants a choice, like what do you want to feel? Uh, so we gave them uh, a, either a high status or a low status target taken from the stereotype content model. And they could choose, uh, knowing that Brian, for example, is a drug addict, they could choose to feel either schadenfreude, either empathy, or uh, nothing at all. And what we would expect if this relationship between SDO and these emotions are motivated 
that people with higher levels of SDO would be less likely to choose to feel empathy overall, but especially towards low status targets. Um, but this pattern should reverse for schadenfreude, that people with higher levels of SDO would want to feel schadenfreude towards these low status groups uh, in particular. And so here, uh, the x-axis again corresponds to SDO. For, for this graph, the y-axis is corresponding to the probability of choosing a particular emotion. And there's a line at one third because that represents a random responding. And I found some support for my hypothesis that the relationship between SDO and these emotions are motivated. So SDO was negatively correlated with choosing to feel empathy overall, but this relationship was really strong for low status targets compared to high status targets. Now, while we didn't find SDO to be differentially related by low status or high status, one, we found that it, is, it was uh, positively related but only for the low status targets, which was in line with our hypotheses. And we've replicated uh, this finding uh, several times just by directly asking people, what do you desire to feel towards either a low status or a high status target and uh, seeing the relationship between that and SDO. So for my third uh, finding in this sort of beginning part of the model, uh, I sort of wanted to think more broadly about, well, why SDO? And I'm kind of arguing that, you know, SDO reflects this competitive view of the world, and it seems kind of special when it comes to um, being connected with empathy and counter-empathy. But that's an empirical question. And so uh, what I wanted to do was to sort of test it with another ideology that is well known in the literature, which is right-wing authoritarianism. And so just to give you a definition of right-wing authoritarianism, uh, it measures the extent to which individuals are engaging in authoritative thinking, such that you know, people should obey leaders, you know, they should strongly commit to a party line. But more importantly, is that SDO and right-wing authoritarianism collectively explain up to 75% of the variance in people's prejudicial attitudes, making uh, it an empirical question whether or not right-wing authoritarianism is also relating to empathy and schadenfreude in the way that SDO is as well. And so to answer sort of this question about how SDO and right-wing authoritarianism are uh, relating to these emotions, what we did was have people respond to two types of empathy and schadenfreude. So first, we measured people's levels of just trait levels of empathy and schadenfreude. So they just, you know, filled out uh, two separate scales that are just people's feelings of empathy and schadenfreude more generally. But then we uh, assessed group-specific empathy and schadenfreude. So in the case of empathy, uh, we had uh, we pretty much had four groups. So we had uh, homeless people, we had drug dealers, we had undocumented immigrants and medical specialists that sort of range in how either competitive or dangerous they are from the point of view of people with either higher levels of SDO or uh, RWA. And so an example of a group specific empathy question, uh, they asked, they answered, you know, when I see a homeless person being taken advantage of, I feel kind of protective towards them. And so this was answered for all four groups of this group specific empathy. And they also uh, indicated group specific schadenfreude. So, you know, it feels good to see a drug dealer encounter a little difficulty. And so what we are interested in is how does SDO and right wing authoritarianism um, relate to both trait levels of empathy and schadenfreude, as well as group specific empathy and schadenfreude. And what we found, if we just focus first on empathy, is that it's actually SDO and not right wing authoritarianism that is negatively correlated with just trait levels of, of empathy. And then when we think about the groups more specifically, we see that uh, SDO is correlated negatively with empathy, but only for groups that um, are in line with the worldview. So it's really only homeless people and undocumented immigrants, those groups that are deemed competitive, uh, that shows this relationship between SDO uh, and the negative relationship between SDO and empathy. For schadenfreude, we see something similar in terms of trait levels of schadenfreude. That is only uh, SDO and not RWA that is positively correlated with trait levels of schadenfreude. And then when we just look at uh, this relationship more broadly with the more group specific, we see that it's SDO that is correlated with schadenfreude primarily for groups that are deemed competitive. Uh, even though right-wing authoritarianism was too, you can see that the correlations between SDO uh, and these group specific schadenfreude are almost twice as strong uh, as that of um, RWA, suggesting that there's something more uh, unique about SDO when it comes to these empathic and counter-empathic emotions. Okay, so uh, for those first three findings, what I was doing is really focusing on the beginning part of this model uh, that I 
uh, have been developing. And so in the second or the last two findings, what I'm going to do is focus on the second part, thinking about more uh, behavior type uh, outcomes. And so uh, what I've focused on is this idea that while we know that SDO leads to support for group harm, that schadenfreude might be a unique mediator, that the reason why we need to think about schadenfreude is because uh, it mediates the relationship between people's worldviews and their engagement in harm. And so to do that, uh, what I did was uh, assess people's levels of empathy and schadenfreude towards uh, one of three low status groups in the United States and they're low status in different ways. And so after I measured people's levels of emotions towards those groups, I looked at how much people supported either explicitly harmful or explicitly helpful policies towards that group. And what we would expect is SDO leads to uh, increased uh, support for harmful policies and decreased support for helpful, but how do these emotions mediate? And so the first thing uh, that we found was just looking at the correlations between empathy and schadenfreude in terms of harm. So if schadenfreude is important for us to pay attention to, then we expect that schadenfreude will be more strongly related to support for harmful policies than uh, is empathy. And that's exactly what we found, that schadenfreude is almost twice as strong for support for harmful policies. I'm only showing you undocumented immigrants, but we find this pattern for both undocumented immigrants, poor people, as well as LGBT. But thinking about uh, this whole uh, model as a whole, thinking about the relationship between SDO and policy uh, support scales mediated by empathy and schadenfreude, uh, I ran six parallel mediation models. Now, I'm not going to overwhelm you with a whole bunch of uh, mediation models because that's ridiculous, but I'm just gonna sum up the findings here. And so we found support for our hypotheses in four out of six mediations. So schadenfreude was a stronger mediator for harmful policies for the poor and undocumented immigrants, while empathy was a stronger mediator between uh, undocumented immigrants and LGBT. Now, the last finding uh, that I want to talk about before I let you go is this idea of schadenfreude might be a unique me mediator, not just for policy support, but for behavior. And so to test behavior, what I used was a economics, um, economics game called the joy of destruction game within a political context. And what uh, participants uh, did was to learn the game. They watched an in-group member be punitive to an out-group member. So in this game, you can use some of your points to destroy the uh, points of another person. And so this opponent could be either an in-group member or an out-group member. And so you can see sort of if you use two points, uh, you can uh, burn the opponent's four points of the opponent, et cetera, et cetera. And so what we did was, uh, as they were learning this game, uh, watching an in-group member be punitive to an out-group member, we assessed their levels of empathy and schadenfreude felt in response to this out-group member's misfortune here. So what we're interested in is whether the level of schadenfreude felt would influence how participants played the games themselves. Would they too be punitive towards out-group members? And if so, would the emotions that they felt while watching the game matter? And the answer is yes. So similar to those policy support measures that I showed, again, the amount of schadenfreude felt while watching had a stronger relationship to participants' harmful behaviors than did the amount of empathy that they felt. And in addition, higher levels of SDO was related to uh, increased harm towards outgroups, so more points burned, but this relationship was more strongly mediated through schadenfreude compared to empathy. Okay, so that was a whirlwind uh, talk, so let me just quickly conclude. Um, so uh, in 2018, Adam Sewer, who was a writer for The Atlantic, he wrote an article entitled The Cruelty is the Point, offering the opinion that some of these nasty partisan behaviors seen, at least in American politics, was motivated by the actual delight in the suffering of others. So he was writing specifically about politics, but I think this idea that cruelty towards other groups can facilitate violence is a more general one. And I think there's been an increase in rigid beliefs about us versus them fueling intergroup animosity. And these are the exact conditions under which Schadenfreude thrive, suggesting that we're not only in an empathy deficit as a nation, uh, but we might also be in a Schadenfreude surplus. And I think these circumstances make Schadenfreude particularly timely to study, but we as uh, behavioral scientists have perhaps overlooked Schadenfreude's relevance to group conflict. And I think for good reason, uh, behavioral scientists have focused on the ways that hierarchies are maintained through subtle or implicit channels, but blatant forms of prejudice and discrimination are very much so present in society. Uh, and so I think in order to uh, ameliorate intergroup conflict and violence, we need to understand when humans choose to be demons, as well as when they choose not to be angels.
Okay, so with that, uh, I thank you for your time and uh, my lovely collaborators, Nina uh, and Jim Sedanius on this work. Thanks, Kira. That was, that was fascinating work. Um, yeah, so for, we have a few minutes for those who are who joined a little bit late. Um, if you have questions, please drop them in the, um, the Q&A function at the Zoom at the bottom. After each speaker, we'll try to take a couple questions, um, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions in the second hour as well. Well, we give it a minute. Um, you know, one one question I had was just in terms of how you're thinking about empathy. So as I know you're, I'm sure you're well familiar, like the, the question of how we define empathy is notoriously like challenging for the field. And I, I was just curious, like with some of the early ways you were thinking about empathy as positioned against counter empathy, as a sort of alignment between your feelings and those of the target. I guess if you could speak more to, you know, how you see that relating to things like concern, compassion, you know, some of the uh, approaches like, you know, feeling like you feel protective towards the target. Like, how do you see those relating to each other in this context? That's a really great question. Part of the reason why I focus so much on affective empathy is because we've only measured schadenfreude affectively. So the more that I, I do this work, the more I realize I don't know anything about schadenfreude, <laughs> such as like, what are the cognitive components of it? You know, do we need perspective taking in order to feel schadenfreude? Uh, based on the definition you kind of do, you need to know what another person is feeling so you can feel the opposite of it. And yet perspective taking should also then increase perhaps your levels of empathy. Um, and so I think that uh, hopefully future work, I can get into some of these uh, components around cognitive empathy versus affective empathy. I feel that um, at least when it comes to these ideologies, that there's probably just a negative relationship between you know SDO and these more cognitive forms of empathy. But in the moment that there's a lot more movement and a lot more fluctuations. And I think those fluctuations of emotions in the moment is really where a lot of the action is going to take place when it comes to behaviors, especially in uh, intergroup contexts. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's how I've been thinking about it more broadly. No, that, that's definitely helpful. I mean, I mean, it seems like the, the idea of the, the cruelty being the point does presuppose some degree of mentalizing and understanding of the target's experiences. It does part of the, the thinking. Um, I do see a couple of questions that have popped in and, you know, other panelists, Felipe, Aran, if you have any questions too, um, please feel free to chime in. We do have the two questions we have in the chat so far. Um, one from Aldine is, the, this person wanted to know about demographics for research, research participants to more broadly characterize the samples. Yeah, so sorry, I was giving a very high level um, overview. But the demographics for each of those findings vary. So in the first study, we only looked at uh, white Americans because we were interested specifically in a, a racial outgroup dynamic. And some of these other studies, we focused just on Americans more generally. Um, I think at least in one of the those studies, we recruited like a, a nationally representative sample. And then in the last a study that I presented, which was within Democrats and Republicans, we recruited equal numbers of Democrats and Republicans. We haven't necessarily found that demographics like gender or oh, race when we're not studying race uh, necessarily matters. Um, but I think it's an empirical question, especially given uh, the work on like gender and empathy. Um, but we're not necessarily finding that gender is doing a lot uh, in these studies. And so most of the participants are from prolific. So they have just like this kind of standard age range. So the ages can range from 18 up until 70, uh, depending on how people or who wants to respond to the particular experiment. Um, one thing I haven't done is directly test this model with low status targets as participants. Um, I think that that's a very interesting question. When I have tried, it gets extremely messy, in part because what does it mean for someone who's already low status to believe in hierarchy and for that they want for them to want the hierarchy to, to stay the same? So I think it gets it gets kind of kind of complicated. So that's the demographic question. And then can I answer the uh, possible reasons for the Schadenfreude surplus? So I think uh, in part what's going on is the world is becoming more diverse. 
And I, I almost feel like we're at the, I, I'm not the last gasp uh, before uh, diversity almost just becomes the norm, but I think that we're seeing kind of a pushback in diversifying um, spaces. And in those spaces, I think that's where people feel the most threat, uh, especially those who historically had power. And so these group lines are becoming just really entrenched and people are really interested in sort of uh, returning like America, make America great again, or moving back to spaces that are much more conservative. And so in those spaces, that's where Schadenfreude, I think, thrive. And part of the reason why I think we need to understand whether or not these intergroup dynamics are marked by Schadenfreude is because appeals to empathy likely will backfire when it's Schadenfreude that's undergirding what's going on. Uh, I think a great example is what happened in the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, in the United States, there was a lot of calls for people to be kind to those who didn't want to get the vaccine. And I think people who got the vaccine felt very happy when people who did not were getting sick. Like it wasn't just a lack of empathy. There was some real animosity underneath it. And so calls for empathy, I think, actually backfired and made people feel even more so know they're getting what they deserve, uh, which meant that we probably needed a different intervention in, in, in that space. What those interventions are, I have no idea because I don't think we know a lot about Schadenfreude yet. Uh, but that, if you give me like two years, I should be able to answer that question. Okay, I'm done. So a couple of quick follow-ups. Just I'm seeing a couple of questions in the chat that um, build right off what you're just saying. Uh, one from Karina is, hi Karina. Uh, one is that how people admit to social desirability about empathy and Schadenfreude so she's asking about, um, are people less willing to admit experience schadenfreude to others, but perhaps also to themselves than they are willing to admit not experiencing empathy? And do you feel, have do you have this intuition as well? And does the data bear this out? And there's another question a little bit further down from an anonymous attendee that's about whether schadenfreude and empathy are sort of a zero sum thing or if they could kind of interweave with each other. Both phenomenal questions. So I wanna answer the, the last one first. I don't think that they are mutually exclusive. Uh, I actually, that's why I tend to measure them separately and not on a singular dimension, because I think we can experience both high levels of empathy and high levels of schadenfreude or, or vice versa. Now, how that then impacts behavior is a separate empirical question that I don't have an answer to. But I think, you know, maybe the best example is, you know, imagine watching someone walk into a door, a glass door, you probably will chuckle. Uh, you, you know, you might feel a little bit of schadenfreude, but you also probably will feel some empathy towards them. And so that shows that you can feel both of these emotions at the same time. Um, so I, I don't necessarily see them as zero sum. And I think the lack of zero sum nature is highlighted when you really think about the lack of empathy isn't antipathy. It's just kind of nothing. Like, I'm not really thinking about you. I'm not checking for you. I'm not, I don't care one way or the other, but I'm not necessarily going to actively go out and harm you. I think that requires a, a different uh, emotional, emotional drive. Um, but then this idea of whether or not people want to admit schadenfreude, people don't necessarily want to admit uh, to feeling schadenfreude. So your intuition is right. But what is the case is that there are contexts where people feel very comfortable admitting it, and politics is one of them. People have no problem admitting feeling schadenfreude to the point where people are more comfortable saying, yes, I feel schadenfreude towards my political outgroups, then I feel empathy. Like, you, you're, you're usually it's empathy is high, schadenfreude, you know, is floating somewhere around, I don't know, 15 to 20 on a 100 point scale. That's not true in politics. It's also not true depending on the specific target. So I have found, especially as a function of SDO, that people are very comfortable expressing schadenfreude towards homeless people. Uh, to the point where people are moving, you know, above the midpoint uh, on these scales uh, as a function of SDO. So I, 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 there have been other work looking at Schadenfreude more um, like physiologically, and I would love to do that. It requires some fancy equipment that I don't necessarily have, but I will get uh, grant funding to do. Uh, but you can sort of look at the smile muscles um, and sort of people's small twitches of smiles in response to something. Um, that would be a more uh, subtle way of measuring measuring Schadenfreude. Great questions. Great, and I would be remiss if there's just one last quick question. So uh, my colleague Sean is asking, do you tend to see, in terms of going back to demographics, similar things for Democrats and Republicans? Ooh, that's a great question. So in that last study that I showed you, the answer to that was yes. But I've measured uh, uh, empathy and Schadenfreude within the political realm more broadly. 
And that answer is no. I actually find that Democrats are much more comfortable admitting schadenfreude than Republicans are, which kind of is counterintuitive to what you, you would think. But I think that's because Democrats really feel some kind of way towards Republicans of just yeah, I'm angry, uh, and I, you know, I'm I'm feeling a lot of emotions. So uh, I have I found that I've also measured a form of SDO. I'm going to call political SDO, where I take the SDO items and instead of social groups or groups, I replace it with political groups. And then I find that also uh, Democrats tend to have higher levels of political SDO than do Republicans. So there seems to be something special, or not necessarily special, but interesting in the political realm when it comes to ideology and emotions. And I'm really excited to uh, tap tap into that, so. Perfect. Well, thanks for fielding all those questions. I, uh, those of you who have unanswered questions, um, we'll, we'll, we'll circle back once we, when we get to the broader group discussion. So I'll hold on to some of the ones, um, but yeah, thank you for uh, chiming in everyone. So now let's, uh, let's shift gears. So I wanna thank you, Kira. I want to introduce uh, Felipe de Brigard, um from Duke University. So he is the Fuchsberg Levine Family Associate Professor of Philosophy at Duke. He's also appointed as Associate Professor of Psychology and Neuroscience and runs the uh, Imagination and Modal Cognition Lab. Uh, he received his PhD from UNC Chapel Hill in philosophy with a concentration in psychology and cognitive neuroscience. I was actually a grad student at the same time as you, Felipe, and I think we were in some of the same classes or a couple. It was kind of a... Yeah, you were on the other side of the sec of the second floor at Davy. The philosophy and psychology buildings were right across the street from each other. It was a wonderful time. Yeah. Um, and yeah, after UNC, Felipe went to, uh, did a postdoctoral degree at uh, a postdoctoral position at, in psychology at Harvard. Uh, his work focuses on memory and imagination. How episodic memory shapes counterfactual thinking and how this uh, changes how we think about different kinds of events. Also, how uh, people engage in simulation, reconstruct memories, how people use attention and conscious recollection. He's received numerous awards, um, the Stanton Prize from Society for Philosophy and Psychology, a Rising Star from Association for Psychological Science, uh, many grants from National Science Foundation on neuroimaging, John Templeton Foundation on some of the work he'll be talking about today on forgiveness, forgetting, and reconciliation, and from the National Institutes of Health on episodic memory. He also co-runs with Walter Sinder Armstrong the uh, Summer Seminars in Neuroscience and Philosophy, and has published in many of the field's top journals. So uh, I think today he'll be talking about some work on forgiveness and reconciliation. And so whenever you are ready, Felipe, please take it away. Super. Thank you so, so much for that very nice presentation. And yes, we not only were uh, in opposite buildings, but also on opposite sides of the second floor, because as you might remember, I was in Kelly's lab, which was on the other side of the social side. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you so much for this invitation. Before I start talking about uh, forgiveness, I one thing that I wanted to mention, and I learned so, so much from your presentation, Dr. Hudson, is uh, to what extent that Schadenfreude that you're feeling that you documented against the homeless is so typical or is specific of North America. I have been living in the United States for 20 years now. And one of the things that have impressed me the most is a significant difference between my country, my home country, which is Colombia, and here is that here poverty seems to be moralized. It's like, oh, if you're poor, it's because you must have done something wrong. Everyone can do it. Whereas in, in countries in which um, there is less of a perception of social mobility, uh, maybe you don't see that Schaffenfraude as much. It would be a, an interesting question to explore. Um, but anyway, so thank you so much again for inviting me. Today, uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this sort of new research project that I have been engaged in on looking at the relationship between memory and forgiveness. Um, so as Derek was saying before, I am primarily a memory researcher. I was trained as a cognitive scientist and as a philosopher, and I did all those sort of like low, low level kind of boring studies on memory to see like hit rates and false alarms and so on and so forth. Uh, and a lot of my work has been trying to push the idea that memory is really not for, uh, is not a system that tries to reproduce the things with fidelity, but rather that it is a system that is engaged in, a, in mental simulation, and in particular, the reconstruction of mental simulations for the purpose of uh, hedging future uncertainty. Um, and as a result, I have argued in many places that memory and imagination interact and that they do so particularly at retrieval. 
However, most of the research uh, about the interaction between memory and imagination at retrieval has focused on negative consequences of this interaction, particularly how information at the time of retrieval can influence our memories and generate false memories that lead us to identify false uh, the wrong people in the line of uh, when we're testifying or like remember like wrong things, right? So typically the research has been focused on negative consequences. However, a lot of my research, at least in the past, you know, like 10 years ago or so, uh, was to try to understand why does this interaction occur to begin with? And in addition, whether it might be possible that there are positive consequences of this interaction between memory and imagination at retrieval. And basically the assumption um, here or the model in which, under which I am working is uh, this series of more recent um, sort of developments in the science of memory. So according to the traditional view, uh, can you see my cursor here? Okay, good. According to the traditional view, when you experience a particular event, you encode that event. And at the time of encoding, that memory trace, if you want, is unstable. So you can sort of block the encoding of the event and so forth. However, once the event is consolidated, the memory gets stored and it is stable. It cannot be altered, okay? Uh, however, in the last sort of 25 years or so, it has been shown that when you reactivate the memory at the time of retrieval, those original memories once again become unstable and prone to modification. So there's a bit, uh, there's been quite a bit of work in which uh, the original content of the memory here is actually modified at the time of the reconsolidation after it has been retrieved. Right, so uh, there's a bunch of research showing how far different pharmacological agents and so forth can actually influence that reconsolidation and alter the mem the content of the original memory. Some of those manipulations are behavioral manipulations, and in our lab we have been using behavioral manipulations in which what we ask participants is to reactivate negative autobiographical memories in the context of generating what we call episodic counterfactual thoughts imagining alternative ways in which a past personal event could have occurred but did not. Typically, when we engage in episodic counterfactual thinking, we imagine alternative better ways in which an event could have occurred, and that typically leads to feelings of regret. However, there is another way in which I can engage in counterfactual thinking, which is to imagine not a better way in which the event could have occurred, but actually a worse way. So suppose that you uh, get into a car accident, and as a result of that, your car is totaled. So one, typically what you imagine is something like, oh man, if only I had veered off right prior to that, then I would have been fine. That's the typical, the automatic sort of reaction that we have. What we do in the lab is that we prevent people from engaging in upward counterfactual, and then we ask them to engage in downward counterfactuals. Namely, we ask them to imagine how worse it could have been. Maybe you could have lost your legs. Maybe you could have lost your limb. And that typically generates a feeling of relief. By incorporating the feeling of relief in the in the content of the original memory, what you actually do is that you modify that content, or as we call it, you mollify the content, and then the next time that they retrieve that negative memory, it feels less hard. So we have done a lot of work on that with individuals with depression, individuals with anxiety. I won't walk you through all of the details, but uh, just to give you one, one sort of idea of what was going on here, we actually did a, a very recent study. This was... Uh, spearheaded by my graduate student, Natasha Pri, uh, um, who's now a professor at UNC. And Natasha uh, got participants with different levels of anxiety to engage in either counter downward counterfactual thinking or to engage in cognitive and in, 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 uh, temporal distancing, which is a very well known sort of uh, technique in cognitive behavioral therapy, in which participants are asked to imagine, how are you going to feel 10 years from now? Uh, with this negative memory. And that typically reduces the emotion and that typically reduces affect down the road. We actually discovered that engaging in downward counterfactual is more efficient than temporal distancing when it comes to reducing uh, feelings of regret down the road. So it is it's, it's as powerful and sometimes uh, um, even more powerful than well-known uh, strategies for emotional reappraisal in cognitive, in cognitive therapy. So um, with this sort of frame in mind, um, then a lot of my work has shown that we can sort of constantly use imagination to modify the affective contents of previous autobiographical experiences so that we can more easily carry our past. 
Um, and we have shown in some of this work that we can use episodic counterfactual thinking during memory re reactivation for the better. In fact, we can use counterfactual thinking as an emotional reappraisal strategy during memory reactivation. But then I started thinking, what about other psychological states that can help us modify the content of negative autobiographical memories for the better? And then I started thinking that maybe forgiveness is such a process, that maybe when we forgive, what we're actually trying to do is to modify the affective content of a past autobiographical memory of a wrongdoing. So I started to think about this in, uh, in 2019, in the second semester of 2019. I was just curious. I knew nothing, and I still know very little, but I knew nothing about forgiveness. But I just thought that when you forgive an event, you don't forget the event. Uh, nevertheless, you obviously feel very different toward the perpetrator or toward the event um, than when you haven't forgiven it. So I went to Colombia uh, to give a talk on something unrelated. And then at dinner, I sat with my very good friend, Santiago Amaya, a fantastic philosopher. And I told Santiago, dude, I have this weird idea. Um, I think that that forgiveness involves something like emotional distancing or, or emotional reappraisal. And he said, get out of town. I am literally writing that paper right now. So uh, we were like, oh, this is great. And, and I think he was exactly right. So he, this is a philosophy paper called Forgiving as Emotional Distancing, highly recommended. So I told him, I think that you're exactly right. I think that it's a good idea. Um, what you are saying in theory and philosophy, I think that we can actually gather empirical data in support of. Uh, so he said, oh, let's go ahead and do it. And then I came back to the US and then I got noticed that I got tenured. So I said, all right, now I am tenured. So I am going to go big. I want to do this like really, really big. I don't want to do like not like just the MTurk kind of thing. I want to do it in Colombia. I want to engage in, in this project uh, in Colombia. So before I tell you a little bit more about the project, let me tell you a little bit about the conceptualization of autobiographical memory that I am dealing with here. So um, as you might know, memories are multidimensional in the sense that different kinds of contents can pull apart. So for instance, in, uh, show we can show that people remember sometimes episodic details better than they remember affect or that they can remember times or things like that at different scales. Not only that, uh, forgiveness affects different aspects of an autobiographical memory at different rates. A very well-known distinction is the distinction between the episodic details of an event. So suppose that you have a memory of going with your family here to a picnic, par uh, a picnic um, at the park or whatever. And then you might remember very well, you know, the flavors, the smells. And you might even remember very well the spatial arrangement of the people and the objects around you but you might not the, remember the affective details that well. Um, or uh, by contrast, you can also remember the valence or the intensity of the event very, very well, but you might not remember sensory and spatial components. There is plenty of work, particularly work done by, uh, by Marcia Johnson, showing very clearly the dissociations between episodic details and affective details. So um, the, I started to think, as I mentioned in 2009, I think actually in 2020 at this point, uh, um, how do memory and forgiveness interact? Um, and I wanted to test the hypothesis that forgiveness impacts the affective and not the cognitive or episodic components of autobiographical memories of past wrongdoings. So by cognitive or episodic components, I haven't really quite decided, but by cognitive or episodic components, I talked about sensorial and sensory and spatial components, whereas by affective components, I talk about valence and intensity. And the suggestion is that uh, what forgiveness achieves is something like a memory mollification, the reduction of negative affect at the time of retrieval, as opposed to a cognitive or an episodic mollification. So the thought is that if forgiveness involves the emotional reappraisal of past wrongdoings, uh, then the question is, could alternative emotional reappraisal? And this is a second question. So if I am right, and if Santiago is right about this forgiveness involving emotional reappraisal, then could alternative emotional reappraisal strategies employed in autobiographical memory research increase people's tendencies to forgive? Um, and the third question is, can we put these ideas to test in the populations of political of victims of political violence in Colombia, which is where I am from? So to be able to uh, to conduct this project, then I needed to gather some pilot data, and then I needed to gather a team. And what I want to tell you in the rest of this talk is 
those two steps, how I gathered the pilot data and how I gathered the team to get the grant. So um, as you might remember, 2020 was marked by a very important event in everyone's life. So as I was getting ready to start the pilot data, the world had a very different idea and put a pandemic in front of me. So I couldn't do it uh, in person. I had to do it um, online. Uh, so, but still it sort of worked. So the, the paper, which is now currently under review and was spearheaded, spearheaded um, uh, by a team of, of researchers back then, uh, is, uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about the team in a second, um, but Gabriela is the main person here as a graduate student um, in my lab. Basically, um, what we wanted to do was to uh, test two hypotheses. And to get to that, let me just give you a tiny little bit of background. And here, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the philosophy of forgiveness. Um, so there are different, different accounts of what forgiveness uh, might mean. One of the most influential accounts is what uh, is often called the emotional account of forgiveness, which is typically traced back to Bishop Joseph Butler's sermons on forgiveness and resentment in 1726. Um, there, he says that forgiveness involves the forswearing or the overcoming of resentment, and many philosophers have suggested uh, as much and like endorse this, this emotional account of forgiveness. Um, but then a further question emerges is like, why does this change in emotion occur? What is the reason why do we have this change in emotion? Um, in 2001, a philosopher, Pamela Hieronymi, uh, wrote a very influential paper on the, on the notion of forgiveness where uh, she argued among many other things that maybe when we forgive, we revise our judgment of, on the perpetrator or of the wrongdoing. So uh, we forgive the perpetrator uh, or we forgive that wrongdoing because we stop thinking of that event as being wrong or as the perpetrator as being morally responsible. Now, the problem with that is that that generates a very serious paradox It's like, wait, if I think of the perpetrator no longer as morally responsible, or if I don't think of the event uh, no longer as being a wrongdoing, then why on earth do I want to forgive, right? If any, I excuse. If my dog steps on my gardenias, I don't have to forgive my dog. I excuse my dog. It's like, well, it was, you didn't mean to or whatever. So it doesn't seem as though this is the right answer. It seems as though maybe the change in emotion comes from elsewhere. So another philosopher, uh, last name Bloomstein, suggests that maybe what happens when we forgive is that we actually forget. So in a sense that uh, our, the contents of our episodic memories fade away a little bit as time goes by, and in so doing, they carry along a reduction in the affect that is associated with that memory. We call this hypothesis the episodic fading account. Uh, uh, so. The, the thought is, again, that as the episodic details of the wrongdoing fade, so does our change in emotion, right? By contrast, we uh, there is the emotional reappraisal account that Santiago has defended, according to which uh, we modify just the emotional content of the memory of the wrongdoings, but our cognitive or, or uh, episodic details actually remain the same. So what we wanted to do in the pilot data we conducted in, 19, in 2020, um, or 2020 and 2021, uh, was to actually test those two hypotheses uh, against one another. So essentially, just to give you an overview, according to episodic fading account, what you should expect to see in, is that uh, both uh, there is going to be a change both in the episodic components as well as the defective component as a function of whether the, uh, as a function of your forgiveness, right? Such that people that have forgiven will have lower episodic and lower effective components, whereas those that have not will have higher episodic and higher effective. By contrast, the emotional reappraisal account suggests that there shouldn't be any difference whatsoever between the episodic components, uh, namely both people that have forgiven and people that have not forgiven should remember the, uh, the episodes and the uh, cognitive aspects of the memory equally well, whereas those that have forgiven should just have a reduction in the affective reactions uh, relative to those that, not, that have not forgiven. So uh, we conducted four studies. I am going to run quickly through the results because the results basically support the emotional reappraisal account. So the first one um, was a pilot data between a pilot study between subjects where we randomly assigned participants to a forgiven versus a non-forgiven 
um, uh, condition. And we gave them what is called the memory characteristics questionnaire, which was once again developed by Marcia Johnson. Uh, that is the, the paradigmatic questionnaire that allows you to distinguish different components of autobiographical episodic memories. And basically what we found is that there was no difference in any of the episodic characteristics between forgiven and non-forgiven, but there was a reduced affective characteristics at retrieval. In particular, the three, the three uh, main uh, markers of emotional affect, which is the tone of the memory, how negative is your memory now that you remember it, the valence of your memory, how negative is your valence now that you're remembering the event, and how intense is your memory now that you're remembering the event. We replicated that result with a slightly, slightly larger um, uh, set just to make sure that, that we are actually capturing every effect size here. And we find exact replication uh, with, a, with an effect for implications as well, which is also an uh, implications now, which is also an effective characteristic at the time of retrieval. In the third study, um, we wanted to see whether the effect occurs also for perpetrators as well as for victims. So there is a theory in, in philosophy according to which when you forgive um, someone, you release the perpetrator of a particular debt against you. So we wanted to test, and this has never been tested, to see if being forgiven changed your affect. And basically what we, what we found, uh, which was basically I, what you would expect, is no difference in the episodic. Oh, so we, just to explain this one, this one is also between subjects and we randomly assign subjects to one of four conditions. One condition in which they forgave or were not forgiven and, and one in which they were the perpetrator or the victim. So they either did something wrong for which they did were forgiven or not forgiven or they were the victims of something wrong for which they forgave or did not forgive. So that's sort of the two by two. And what we found basically is that there was no difference again in any of the episodic characteristics. And we're talking about a 38 item questionnaire and everything obviously is corrected for a gazillion multiple comparisons. So, uh, so we found absolutely no difference in any of the episodic characteristics, but once again, the four characteristics that index affect at the time of retrieval show a difference. And importantly, you see here that there is a difference, uh, for instance, between tone, uh, between forgiveness and non-forgiveness, but you also see that uh, being the victim tends to have a higher effect relative to being the perpetrator. So there is, in, in other words, there is a little bit of a gain for forgiving, for being forgiven, but there is definitely much more gain in affect for, uh, uh, for forgiving. And finally, the last study, which as you might imagine has to do with uh, responding to a reviewer, uh, is, <laughs> is um, one concern is that we find that there is a moral difference in the judgment, right? So here is very, it's very tricky. We measure moral judgments, like how morally wrong was that event? Was that effect? Uh, sorry, was the, the wrongdoing? And as you might imagine, people that have not forgiven the, perp forgiven the perpetrator for their wrongdoing, tend to think of the wrongdoing as more morally wrong than those that have forgiven. But here it's very hard to know uh, which one is first. Is forgiving first that is uh, affecting our moral judgment or is our moral judgment what is for, uh, affecting the, the, um, our judgment of forgiveness? It's very hard to tell. Uh, and obviously we don't have IRB nor the desire to generate wrongdoings with different degrees of moral wrongness. So the best thing that we could do is to conduct a well-powered study uh, in which we statistically control for moral wrongness, such that if you can regress it out and to see if you see the exact same event. And sure enough, that's exactly what we find. We once again replicate between subjects uh, for tone, for valence, uh, for intensity. Moreover, we use a, a paradigmatic measure of forgiveness called the TRIM um, that looks at, at avoidance and uh, feelings of revenge and feelings of benevolence. And we do find the, the sort of the mark of forgiveness here. Not only that, we find that the change in the valence at the time of retrieval predicts the changes in, in uh, reality aptitudes to re revenge, avoidance, and benevolence. And all of this is even what we control for perceived moral wrongness of the wrongdoing. So in some we found in our, study, in our studies that autobiographical memories of forgiving wrongdoings are experienced in less negative tone as having fewer implications for one's life 
has less negative valence and with less intensity relative to those of unforgiving wrongdoings. Uh, sorry, this should have been the plural. These differences uh, as, uh, also evident for perpetrators, although the effects are smaller than for victims. We find that the affective reactions at retrieval predicted attitudes of avoidance, revenge, and benevolence toward the perpetrator. And we find that this difference in correlations persist when statistically controlling for perceived moral wrongness. So our final assessment is that this evidence is consistent with the emotional reappraisal view, more so than with the episodic fading account. So we had the pilot data. It was great. So next, I needed the team. So I put it together. I put together this this amazing team. Uh, Santiago is a philosopher at the Universidad de los Andes in Bogota. Pablo Abidbol is a political scientist at the Universidad Tecnológica de Bolívar in Cartagena. Wilson Lopez is a clinical psychologist uh, that probably is the person that knows the most about uh, psychology of peace in Colombia. Kevin Lavar is my colleague uh, who works on emotion. Uh, in uh, memory, and Lucy Elias is a philosopher uh, at Johns Hopkins University, has done a lot of work on forgiveness, uh, including some work on forgiveness in the apartheid. Um, and then I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the region where we study. So, um, so as I mentioned, I'm from Colombia, I'm from Bogota. As many of you know, Colombia had the longest uh, uh, internal conflict and the longest living guerrilla in, I think, in the history of the planet. Um, this is the Colombia in which I grew. I grew up in a very violent country. There was a lot of killings and kidnappings. Uh, this might be familiar to many of you. And in 2016, finally, after more than 50 years of internal conflict that left many, many victims, lots of maimed people and uh, kidnappings and like hundreds of thousands of disappearances, finally in 2016, the peace process was ratified. Here is Satha Juan Manuel Santos who will later on go on to win the Nobel Peace Prize for the peace process in Colombia. Um, so I decided to, to team up with, um, with a group of researchers uh, that work in the what is called the Center for Historic Memory in Colombia in a particular region called Montes de Maria. So to give you an idea, uh, you, you saw the, the map of Colombia um, here. So it's basically at, around this area. Uh, it's called Montes de Maria. It, cons it consists of 15 different municipalities. Uh, this is an extraordinarily mountainous region, uh, which explains also why the guerrilla and the paramilitaries could hide so efficiently, <laughs> because it's just very, very mountainous. Uh, and it is also an it was also an extraordinarily violent place. Uh, right now, they live. It's about half a million people that live there. Uh, but um, over 200,000 of them at some point had to be displaced. Some of them, uh, you know, moved back. In 2001, for instance, Colombia had the largest, the largest number of displaced people in the violence, second only to Sudan. Um, now, and then there were, there had been hundreds of thousands of uh, people disappeared and, uh, you know, almost like 100,000 killings. It was just, it was just a lot, a lot of violence. But as a result of the peace process, many of the people have moved back to their uh, hometowns as well as their perpetrators. So these are direct victims of the violence that are now living next door to the guerrilla member or to the paramilitary that actually you know, killed members of their family because that's part of the peace process. This is a picture that I took. It was a very emotional picture for me. I took it from El Cerro La Canzona overlooking. You can see this is like freaking paradise. Um, it is. And overlooking this region is, is called El Carmen de Bolívar, which uh, when I was growing up, it was basically impossible to imagine to go here. Uh, if you would go there, you wouldn't return alive, basically. So we put I put together the team, we suggested experiments, and we got the grant thanks to the John Templeton Foundation. And we have been working on that grant for the last two years, collecting data. Uh, this is the rest of the team. I highlight Gabriela Fernandez because she is my graduate student that started working with me two years ago. Uh, and sort of leading leading the efforts. And this is the team in the US and the team in Colombia that helps us to, uh, to gather some more of the data. And the data consists in uh, both autobiographical structure, autobiographical interviews, as well as the questionnaires and all of that stuff. Uh, in addition to uh, biophysiological, uh, so which is uh, something that Professor Hudson was mentioning before. So we do actually bring victims of, this is when I was setting up the lab there. Um, we actually bring victims of uh, into the lab and we record their 
their muscle reactions, their skin galvanic responses, and, and so forth. So uh, that's the stage of the project. This is Gabriela teaching them um, how to do the biopack. This was about a year and a half ago. Uh, we finally set it up last year and we started data collection there. This was a picture of my donation of the, of the biopack to the university. And this is sort of the way in which it works. We interview one by one. The interview takes about two hours. We collect a lot of data. And currently we are at, we just came back from Colombia yesterday and we completed 169 uh, one-to-one -one interviews. Um, so we are, we're still in the process, uh, but there is a bunch of projects uh, that are following up on this. Uh, we want to involve the victims and the perpetrators in the process of doing science. So for instance, many of these are leaders, all of them uh, victims themselves, but they are leaders and they contribute uh, to the project with us. Uh, we work closely with the community to identify mental health needs because uh, the suggestion is that if the emotional reappraisal account is on the right track, we do, can devise alternative strategies to promote forgiveness. And as a result, we can help with the, with the transitional justice team that is going on right now in Colombia. And uh, happy to answer uh, any questions that you might have. And thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Felipe. Really fascinating work. Um... It's, it's neat that it, it highlights the interdisciplinarity that we we try to like uh, showcase in the in these events too. Um, if it, we do have one question that came in that I think you sort of answered in the last two studies about whether forgiveness has the same effect for self and for others. Um, uh, yeah. So so I was very curious about that. I love. Um, um, I think that forgiveness is. Not always, because forgiveness is complex, uh, but when the victim is uh, and the perpetrator have a relationship, it is bidirectional. So forgiveness is complex because the perpetrator is not always present. Sometimes you forgive people that have died already. Sometimes you forgive people that have never that haven't asked for an excuse. And in this particular case, you often, in the case of the guerrilla, you have to forgive people that you have never had a uh, relationship with before. Because oftentimes when you have, uh, when you forgive, you forgive your friend because your friend, I don't know, like did something wrong to you, forgot to tell you to go to the, that you were going to the movies or whatever. And then you forgive that because in part you want to repair a relationship that you had before. But oftentimes here, there are people that are forgiving someone they have never met in their lives, right? And that person apologizes in the peace process. Uh, and then you, you're trying to figure like, how does forgiveness work when you want would you neither have a relationship prior to this event, nor do you want to have a relationship after the event, and yet you want to forgive. So forgiveness is extraordinarily dependent on the relationship, the particular relationship that the victim and the perpetrator had. Um, so that's that's something tricky. But one thing that it does happen when you do know the perpetrator and you have a relationship with the perpetrator is that forgiving helps not only the forgiver, but also the forgiven. And that is an aspect that is sometimes not uh, well sort of researched or understood. Building on that, uh, one of our students, Rosemary, has a question about generational memory or cultural memory, where wrongs that wrongdoings that happened in the past, but the memory is kept is quote unquote kept alive or intentionally passed down. Do you think that memory and forgiveness operate the same way in these contexts? Yeah, that's a very good question. And here the answer uh, comes from um, research in philosophy. So uh, I apologize for waxing philosophical a little bit here, but I just find a lot of, 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 of uh, value and insight from philosophers. Um, there is a philosopher whose name I'm forgetting right now, but I, it will come back to me and I'll put it on the, on the chat, uh, um, who wrote a paper about retributions in the United States. Uh, and about how whether you whether universities in particular whether universities or institutions should make retributions for uh, the wrongs of people you know 200 years ago or 150 years ago and her response uh, it really intrigued me and I really liked it is you know when the president of say uh, I, I don't know Duke, for instance, uh, which probably have some some issues with slavery, or chattel slavery years ago, apologizes for chattel slavery, is doing it in on behalf of an institution that is historically extended over time, right? It is not Duke of 2004. It is the whole thing, right? So if you think about individuals or, or um, communities or uh, institutions, 
as having a prolonged life, as being a thing that has existed as an institution for 200 years and so forth, then it makes a lot of sense to think of them as perpetrators because they have been doing, they, they are extended over time. Um, so I think that that something like that could operate in this in this context as well. If the government of the of Colombia did certain policies that led to uh, you know some really like awful killings or whatever fifty years ago, the government exists still as an entity that is fine for them to apologize for what happened in the past because they have the standing to do so. That would be my 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 answer. So we have one more question here. Um, so Mayor Mary was interested in uh, what some more of the specific questions in terms of like what you will do with the interview data. Yes, that's a great question. Thank you. So it, the interview is like super uh, structure, as I mentioned. So we used uh, one well well known and widely used structured interview is called the autobiographical interview and in memory. And basically what it does is that it, it asks individuals to remember a specific episode in their lives. Pe the people talk for a while, then you have special probings in which you probe a little bit more people to retrieve more and more and more details. And you do that while recording. Um, the recording is then transferred and coded by independent, independent uh, raters. Um, in addition to that, we have the questionnaires about their memories. And we have a bunch of other questionnaires about, for instance, beliefs in religion, uh, like questionnaires that tap at forgiveness and so forth. And we ask participants to remember two events, a neutral event and a remand and an event in the conflict, uh, you know, related to the conflict in which, and all of these individuals are direct victims. That is to say they, you know, they saw uh, a parent, a loved one, uh, as a kid, uh, you know, they have, they were literally direct victims. They are being right now uh, receiving like money from the, for the peace process. They're actively participating in the peace process and so forth. So, um, so there's a bunch of analysis that we're going to be doing. Primarily, we're going to be looking at differences in the valence, uh, just you know, in the given the emotional reappraisal account, but also we're going to see if there are moderators like religiosity and things like that, if there are moderators. Um, well, I don't see any more questions currently. Um, I think the incorporation of emotion regulation is fascinating for several reasons, and it's, I think, a point of consistency across all three of your, your lines of work that I'm sure we'll come to in the discussion as well. And I can see some interesting connections between what you're testing and what Kiera is investigating, like in terms of when people would want to engage in forgiveness and as a form of reappraisal. But yeah. let's, let's, um, let's come back to that in the discussion, too. I'm sure there'll be plenty of time. Because I want to, um, if there's no other questions, uh, switch gears. Um, thank you, Felipe. Uh, I want to switch gears to um, our last speaker, Aran Halperin. Uh, let me briefly introduce uh, him. He is a full professor of psychology at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, where he runs the Psychology of Intergroup Conflict and Reconciliation Lab. Um, he received his PhD from the University of Haifa in 2007. In his work, he um, looks at different psychological and political theories and methods to investigate intergroup conflicts, uh, thinking about how to uh, use tools from psychology to understand destructive intergroup conflicts and relations, focusing on topics relating from uh, intolerance, exclusion, violence, conflict, and the roles of emotions and emotion regulation specifically. Um, He's edited several volumes, including four books, uh, Psychological Intergroup Interventions, The Social Psychology of Intractable Conflicts, A Social Psychology Perspective on the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict, and Emotions in Conflict. He has several grants from um, the BSF, the Israel, the Israel Science Foundation on Minority Achievement in Higher Education, the Mind and Life Institute, and the European Re Research Council on Interventions to Promote Intergroup Relations. And so, uh, yeah, uh, thank you for joining us today. And whenever you're ready, please feel free to take it away. Thank you, Derek. Thank you very much. Uh, it's it's pleasure to be here. Um, I, I'll, I'll do something slightly different. Uh, no PowerPoint, first of all. That's a kind of a revolutionary uh, move, I will say. But, but I'll try to explain what, why did I choose to do that this way. Um, so I've been studying, you know, emotional processes and more specifically emotion regulation 
and, and empathy and empathy regu regulation in, in intergroup and violent conflicts for almost two decades. Uh, you know, we've published more than 300 papers on these on these issues. Um, and, and, and specifically, I'm interested in the way empathy can potentially moderate violent conflicts uh, and, and, and also in the more nuanced way of looking at empathy in these kinds of situations. And, and when, when I, and I think that the invitation to this panel came, I don't know, two months ago or a little, little bit around two months ago. And when I sat down to prepare this talk and, you know, I did the usual thing. I went to my most recent like studies and I thought about which ones would be most interesting to present here in a PowerPoint. And then at some point I realized that I simply cannot do that. I mean, it's, I feel, I, I simply feel like, you know, I'm talking to you from Israel in the midst of terrible war between Palestinians and Israelis. Thousands and thousands of Palestinians are killed in, in Gaza. Many of them are innocent Palestinians. Uh, more than 100 Israelis are held hostage in, 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 in Gaza. And for me, you know, preparing a presentation and presenting, you know, a, a, you know, effect sizes and, and significant effects and whatever sounds a little bit strange for, for now. Uh, so what I'll try to do is, you know, to, to do two things at the same time, and I'll try not to go beyond the 15 to 20 minutes that we have here. I'll start by talking a little bit about our work. I'll give a very, very, very broad overview on the work that we've done in the last like 10 years on, on empathy in violent conflicts. Uh, and, and all these papers are published, so you don't need the, my PowerPoint. You can, you can just look, look online and, and see these papers. And then I wanna spend the, the remaining 10 minutes just to share with you some observations that I have on the role of empathy in, in what's happening now between Palestinians and, and Israelis. No data, no studies, no, nothing is published, but, but more, you know, things that we've already studied, many of us, you know, uh, all, all four of us here uh, uh, in the past that are, you know, that I can see them in, in my eyes directly uh, in, in my daily life right now in Israel. And, and, and then we can, we can, you can ask whatever you want in the, in the Q&A section. So, so, so I'll start just mentioning a few, few of the things that we've done in, in recent years. Uh, um, I'll start by saying that, you know, when I started studying empathy in violent conflicts, it was, you know, studying empathy as part of a much, much broader set of emotions. And one of the most interesting things that we found immediately at the beginning was that whereas empathy had very, very meaningful effects on things like people's support for, you know, support providing humanitarian aid to the outgroup or, you know, avoiding collateral damage in times of violent, violent conflicts, a very, very interesting findings that we, we, we revealed immediately at the start of our war, of the beginning of our work, was that we didn't find any association between empathy, people's empathy towards the outgroup, and their support for concrete political compromises. So people can be very, very empathetic towards outgroups. And again, they will try to avoid harming them. They will support providing them with humanitarian aid, but they will not make serious compromises, at least not when we control statistical, statistically control for other emotions. This is a paper published in 2017, uh, uh, led by Nimrod Rosler. And, and that, that was interesting for us because it means that the role of empathy, you know, it's not like the magic tool for conflict. It has influence on some aspects, but not so much on other aspects. And that's, that was really, really interesting for us. A second set of studies, and there we published four or five different papers, and, and many of them were inspired by, by your work, Daryl, on, on, on motivated empathy. And, and I think that also related to, to your work here on, 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 on you know, ideology as a driver of, 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 of motivation to experience empathy. What we've shown in several papers was that people's ideology in the situation of the conflict is very closely associated, not just to their levels of empathy towards the outgroup, but also to their motivation to experience empathy. And there was a paper by Porat and others in JPSP showing that 
the more hawkish people are, the less they want to feel empathy towards Palestinians and also that we can actually manipulate and we can help them or motivate them to experience empathy, even very right-wing people in Israel. One interesting paper that was published two years ago showed that right-wing mothers, both Israelis and Palestinians, wanted their children to downregulate their empathy. So they, in, in simple words, they didn't want the children to feel empathy towards the other side. And what we showed and we coded the, the behavioral interactions between them was that they use specific actions, gestures, words to make sure that their kids will not experience empathy in the context of the conflict because they realized that it has cost some serious costs, and this was published in 2022 in, in, in PSPB. Another interesting line of studies, you know, Kira was asked about ideological symmetries in, 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 in schadenfreude and in empathy. We've published several papers showing asymmetries in, in motivation to experience empathy. It was tested in several countries, not just in Israel, in, in, in several different countries. And in all these places, we showed that both liberals and conservatives experience or you know have less empathy to, to less motivation to experience empathy towards the out group versus their in group but that we can see the, the the empathy motivation gap is much higher among right wingers or republicans than among liberals and this was a, a paper led by Hassan et al et al and, and, and was published in PSPD as well and the last paper I'll mention here before I move to talk a little bit about the current events was, was a paper in which a paper that was published last year in Nature Communication led by Yossi Hassan, in which we showed a, in, in a very, very large field experiment conducted in a, in a art festival in Jerusalem, in which more than 1000 Jews and Palestinians attended the festival. And we showed that we can upregulate or induce empathy among both Israelis and Palestinians, one towards the other, by convincing them that empathy is not a limited resource. What we found in this, in, 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 the, in the initial studies before the festival was that much of the, I mean, the, 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 the explanation for much of the intergroup empathy bias, the, the fact that people experience more empathy towards their own group than towards the out group, is that many people believe that if they'll experience you know, too much empathy towards their own group, they will not have enough empathy left to experience towards the outgroup. And then in a field experiment, we showed that when we make people believe that empathy is not a limited, a limited resource, then the entire, I mean, we, we didn't just minimize the intergroup empathy bias, we simply diminished it. So there weren't, there wasn't any difference, there weren't any differences between the empathy that Israelis, for example, experienced and expressed towards Palestinians versus the empathy they experienced and expressed towards Israelis after they, they went through this, this, this art intervention, convincing them that empathy is not a limited resource. And, and we, we, we replicated this finding uh, several times, and I think that it's an interesting way to, to, to uh, uh, diminish this, this intergroup empathy bias that all, all of us talk about when, when we study empathy in the context of, of group conflicts. So, so these are just four examples for four different lines of studies that we've, we've dealt with in, in the recent years. And, and, and what I do, what I want to do in, in my in the remaining of, of my time is to talk about you know some of the observations that I have some of it some of them are based on data because we do collect data even in the midst of this really terrible and, and crazy war uh, but but most of it is, is is based on simply on what we see around us so so the first thing that I want to talk about is you know it might sound trivial for people to study empathy. Uh, uh, but for me, you know, there's a difference between studying it and, and publishing papers on that, etc., versus actually, you know, seeing it in my in my in my close environment. And that's the the, the total failure of experiencing and expressing empathy towards the suffering of the other in the midst of a war. And that's you know again I, I'm I'm familiar with the concept, but living in Israeli society today it's very, very clear 
that experiencing what, what Israelis have experienced after the Hamas attack on October, October 7th, no matter how much suffering there will be on the Palestinian side, Israelis simply refuse, refuse to experience or express any empathy towards that suffering. And that's, that's, that's you know, it's, it's an amazing psychological phenomenon. What we see here, you know, you don't, people, people actively avoid being even exposed to this suffering. We don't watch any news from Gaza. People don't want to watch any news for, from Gaza. And the TV channels make sure that they don't, you know, broadcast it because people don't want to see it. People actively say, and, and they will say it publicly, even people who consider themselves, you know, leftist, dovish, Democrats will say, you know, there aren't any innocent people in, in Gaza, so we don't care about their suffering whatsoever. And that's something, you know, I've, you know, to, to, to say frankly, I've never, never experienced so directly in, in su such a terrible way, it, it, not, not in my life. So that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is that, 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 that again, you know, we, we live right now in a situation in which there's, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that it's symmetrical in any way, but there's suffering on both sides of the borders. And what we see is that the more people are empathetic towards people of their own group, the more they're exposed to the suffering of their own group, the less they want to hear, the less they have motivation, they, the less they, 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 they even entertain the idea of expressing empathy towards people on the other side of the border. And, 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 and what's really interesting is that people say it explicitly, like they say, you know, I, th there is so much suffering here. I wake up every morning and I feel so much sadness and anxiety that I don't have the mental capacity to even think about people on the other side of, of the border. And that's, you know, the fact that people even express that in, in their own words, like, like, you know, that's a psychological mechanism. That's the mediator in our models, but people talk about it explicitly. And that's quite amazing, at least, at least for me. And the third thing I want to I want to mention in this context is the issue of you know the, the the issue of of emotion what I would call emotional or empathy norms. So it became very very clear, both among Israelis and among the Palestinians, that you're not supposed to. Exp I mean, if you want to be if you want to be considered like an acceptable moral loyal, patriotic part of, of your own society, you're not supposed to experience empathy towards the outlook. And these are things that we see on social media. We see leaders talk about it explicitly, and we also see it in our, in our data. And I think that that's something, you know, we've started studying it uh, just two years ago, like empathy norms or emotional norms and empathy norms as part of it, but it's a fascinating phenomenon. So even people who care about the out group or care about the suffering of the, out, of, of, of the other side in some way, very, very fast internalize the fact that socially they're not supposed to do that. They're not supposed, I mean, if they want to be acceptable members of their community, they're not supposed to do that. And in that sense, empathy norms are very, very powerful. I don't know if I have more time there. Do I, do I have two or three more minutes? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so I just want to mention two, two, two last things that are, are interesting. I think that are interesting, at least, at least for me. One, one, one thing, and I talked at the beginning about the, like the nuance, like, like role of, of empathy in these kind of situations is that, and, and, and I'll tell you, and, and we have some data on that, is that at least at this point, Empathy does not really drive people to action. So one, one of the amazing things that are happen, happening internally within the Israeli society right now is that there is a tension among Israelis between, you know, making a deal to bring back the Israeli hostages that are held in Gaza versus, you know, a, a, a maintaining the war in order to overcome the Hamas and revenge and everything. And, and, and the families of the hostages are trying to induce empathy. 
uh, and they're trying to induce empathy among the Israeli public opinion to drive Israelis to go out to the streets and to demonstrate against the government, to tell the government, you know, it's more important to save these people that are held hostage in Gaza than, you know, to, ma to, to maintain the war, stop the war, but, 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 but save these people. And we see very, very clearly that this empathy tool does not really mobilize people to go out to the streets. People, people are driven by revenge. They're driven by anger. They're driven by many other things. Empathy does not really drive them to action. We're now involved in a very large uh, field intervention using virtual reality related to the, the, the suffering of both Israelis and Palestinians. We don't see any movement in, 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 in terms of leading people to, to collective action. And the last thing I wanna mention is, I mean, we have done some studies testing, even in the last two months, testing the, the, the potential effect of empathy communication, empathy mess messages across group lines. I mean, what would happen if Israelis express empathy towards the suffering of Palestinians, in that case, suffering of Palestinians within Israel? And it, you know, during these studies, we, 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 we revealed something really, really interesting. Again, I don't have yet any conclusive data to support it, but about the distinction between empathy and acknowledgement. And there's, there's an interesting tension here between, you know, Israelis that communicate empathy to Palestinians and telling to them something like, you know, I know how much you suffer, I understand your sadness. I can see how terrible the situation is for you. That's like the kind of empathy messages that you can see versus saying, you know, the same thing, but also saying, and I know that I, you know, I or my group, or I acknowledge the fact that my group are also responsible or is also responsible for part of what, what's happening for you. And what we see, in at least some of these very, very initial studies that we did is that in the midst of such you know terrible violence at least some people are saying or telling us you know i don't need your empathy your empathy in when the situation is so bad your empathy is simply not enough for me i want more i want i mean i will accept your empathy or it can maybe moderate my positions right now but only if it will be accompanied also by some acknowledgement of the wrongdoing conducted by, by, by your group. And, 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 and this tension between acknowledgement and empathy messages is, is also interesting, particularly for studies on interventions in, in ongoing conflict or ongoing violence. And, and, and I think that is also related to, Felipe, to, to your talk about you know, forgiveness. And, and, and it, it, I mean, I, I can see some connections. So, so I'll stop here and again, uh, sorry if I didn't do it in the traditional way. I hope it was interesting. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That was very interesting. Um, and certainly a lot of, I mean, yeah, as you were noting, a lot of connections uh, across the three talks. I mean, how we think about forgiveness and reconciliation and acknowledgement, but also empathy avoidance and, you know, how to think about the relationship between empathy and anger, both from the expressor perspective the expressor pers perspective, but also from the recipient's perspective as well. So what I think we'll do, we have about half an hour. Um, let's take a couple of questions from Iran's talk, and then we'll spend the last like maybe 20 minutes or so um, kind of doing a broader discussion between the between the four of us. And if others have questions in the audience, please, of course, drop them into the chat, the Q&A function. Um, so let's see. Um, okay. So one of my students, former student, Ileana, uh, has a question. So uh, she saw your recent talk at Stanford, which was before the recent events. Is there any way to turn adversity into unity? She's thinking about um, the paper by Schnabel et al., overcoming competitive victimhood findings, people identifying as victims of war versus identifying as Middle Eastern and the paper showing that the former was apparently more promising in reconciliation. And how is that how is that complicated by uh, if, if when suffering is asymmetrical, if you have time to talk about systemic versus individual level attempts and responsibility to ease conflict? 
So a lot of different questions there about uh, perceived victimhood and how to use those perceptions to in the role of adversity in promoting unification. Yes, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm, we need more time to answer these questions, <laughs> seriously. Uh, I, 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 you know, even in this very difficult situation, I, 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 I definitely believe that there are ways uh, to reduce, you know, adversity and, 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 and promote more, you know, reasonable relations between, between these two groups. Uh, I will say that the question of victimhood here is really interesting. And it's interesting mainly because the way these events started, at least this round started. And, and the fact that, you know, after many, many years of Israeli occupation, this specific event started with a Hamas attack that led many Israelis to suddenly feel like they're the victims in this situation, which, you know, definitely if we look at the broader picture, this probably is not, you know, most people wouldn't say that this is the case. But I think that there is an interesting like dynamic here in which the, 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 the very well-established power relations are somehow destabilized in this situation right now. And, and the Palestinians, the Hamas challenged Israel in a way that's never happened in the past, violently, the, you know, in, in that case. And I think that all people now in this situation feel victims. I don't think that this is very constructive right now in, you know, in, in, in the short time frame, uh, but I think that maybe potentially in the future, I mean, this is, you know, Nuwich Nabil's work and can definitely, you know, help us in thinking about ways, ways to address it. I will say one, one more, you know, optimistic thing, and that's the fact that, you know, until five months ago, people didn't believe you know, the, you know, oftentimes when we talk about, um, um, you know, when we talk about a, a hope or despair in situations of conflict, we talk about whether people believe that it's even possible to resolve the conflict, but also whether they, they think that it's urgent. And, and for many, many years in, in, in our area, people didn't think that it's possible to resolve the conflict, but they also didn't think that it's urgent. And I think that what, one optimistic thing that happened, you know, many, many pessimistic things that have happened. But one optimistic thing that happened in the, in the recent months is that at least now people understand that it's really, really urgent to do something. Uh, and I think that it will take us some time. I wouldn't do, you know, inclusive victimhood interventions right now. I don't think that it's, you know, tomorrow morning. But, but, but in the longer, longer time frame, I do think that it can be, can be ready. Great, thank you. Um, another question uh, from Aldine is empathy. So you mentioned like how is empathy received and what do people want in, in times of conflict? Is empathy negated if it's not accepted or received? And this is a question that I think is actually interesting for the broader discussion too, like how we receive empathy and what we want from others in times of conflict. So, so again, I, I, I don't have data to support it, but at least from the you know, very anecdotal kind of indications that, that I say. I think that the main question here is about people's expectations. It's, it's, it's about what, what people, I mean, the way people appraise the situation, but also what do they want to get? What are their needs? What do they want to get from, from the other side? And I think that when, when the other side is the perpetrator, and it's we're not talking about like historical wrongdoings, we're talking about current wrongdoings. So I think that people's expectations are not, I mean, empathy in of itself doesn't really address people's real expectations in these situations. And then at least from what, what we saw in, in our, in our you know, very recent studies is that sometimes people can even see it as insulting. People can say, you know, I mean, do you really believe that you can hurt me so, you know, so badly? And then just expressing empathy would, would do the work. It's simply not enough. And, and, and I think that in that case, the result can be you know, counterproductive. So I want to make sure we have time for discussion between the four of us too. We have about 20 minutes or so. Um, 
And I think there's one question pitched here by Erica that thanked you all for your three great talks and um, was really curious about the role of motivation. And I think it I think it's relevant for all three of your talks, actually. I mean, I think the the question of with, you know, with forgiveness and if we know that reappraisal can have an impact, if we think that reappraisal can have an impact, when what are the conditions under which we would expect people to want to uptake that intervention? Um, but I'm, I'm just curious for kind of pitching this to all three of you, you know, what do you see is that she's asking about the distinction between motivation to experience empathy, if we broaden it and or for and, and or to forgive um, versus the actual experience of doing so itself. Um, we should start. Uh, anybody feel free to jump in. So, um, um, I guess I, I was gonna mention something uh, that Aran just, uh, um, your talk was really interesting and there were a couple of things that I wanted to mention and then I'll ask, uh, sort of give my views on, on this empathy question about forgiveness. Um, so one thing that we have noticed uh, in, in the participants that we deal with, um, that we interviewed is that, um, you know, forgiveness is not something that you can oblige people to do. Right. Uh, so so it's not like I can go in the lab or I can go in the field and say, like, OK, so, uh, you know, the guerrilla members killed 11 members of your family. I want you to forgive them now. Now, that's just just not going to work. Right. That is not how you forgive. Um, so you find in my experience, you find three kinds of, of uh, attitudes from victims toward the perpetrators. There are those uh, that um, want to forgive and are close to forgiving. There are those that do not want to forgive and they're definitely not close to forgiving. And then there's those th that want to forgive but are not close to forgiving. Those are the ones in which the they interventions are more likely to work. Um, and, uh, um, and I also think that this is a second component I also think that it is very important to distinguish between reconciling and forgiving. Um, reconciliation is something that often has to happen if you want to continue on with your life. So many of the people that we uh, that we work with are victims are literally moving back to the homes from which they were displaced. But so are the former guerrilla members and the demobilized paramilitaries that are living back again where they were. It's just that sometimes the assassins of the people in the context of the war were, you know, the son of your neighbor and so forth. And they are now having to live back together. Sometimes when I go on this uh, on these visits, I know that like 5% of the people in motorcycles around me are former guerrilla members or former paramilitaries that very likely killed hundreds of people. So uh, that's the community in which you're having to live with. So reconciliation is just not an option. You really have to do it. But that doesn't mean that you have to forgive them. So um, so it's a, it's a very important component to say like, uh, and, and also to relieve people from the responsibility of having to forgive. Uh, you know, it's fine to have unforgivable offenses, but that doesn't mean that you have to live with the pain because you can do the emotional reappraisal stuff or uh, that you cannot reconcile. And then the third component that I was going to, to mention in response to this is that um, forgiveness, th what we have seen is that there are two things that are very likely necessary for forgiveness to happen. Uh, one is time. You don't forgive immediately after. And this is something that Iran said. You need time to happen. You need, uh, you don't, time doesn't do it alone, as we have seen. Uh, time doesn't do it alone, but time is a necessary condition for forgiveness. You don't forgive the person who is at the, at the time in which you're receiving the wrongdoing. That is just that there is there is that time component. And the second is um, is empathy. So so there is one of the most sort of well known, if you want, clinical intervention of forgiveness, which I have lots of problems with, but I also like certain aspects of. Is called the Reach out and Reach is an acronym that stands for Recall, Empathize. Uh, give an altruistic gift, commit, and hold on to. Uh, that's the what the acronym starts for. And it literally says that a major component of um, forgiving the perpetrator is to try to put yourselves in their shoes uh, and just to sort of feel the, the feeling of that. It's not 
um, sufficient, but it seems as though it is actually highly necessary for people to com to commit to forgiveness. And usually, and this is the last thing that I will mention, is that empathy is more effective as a motivator um, when you not only empathize with someone that you want to forgive, but you want to empathize with someone who's act who's giving you an apology. So forgiving is super. So so for forgiving, apologizing, acts of contrition. Uh, atonement, all those things seem to improve the chances of empathy being effective. Um, so you, which is what makes it really hard sometimes to forgive people that never apologize. Just to kind of come back to the question of motivation to experience and empathy, if you are motivated to experience an emotion, you just might engage in behaviors that make it more likely that you're going to experience that emotion. So you can think about situation selection, for example. If I do not want to feel empathy for a homeless person, I might cross the street. Uh, and sometimes you might experience an emotion in spite of your motivation not to. So uh, you see this all the time with pets. A dad is like, I don't want no pet. And then the pet comes and it got the puppy eyes. And it's like, I am experiencing all this emotion. And I didn't, I was, I'm not motivated to, I don't want to, and yet I'm still feeling it. So that's just the tension between motivation to experience an emotion and the emotion itself. Very quickly, I would say that uh, um, I think that there's, there's the, the way I see it, there's, there has been for many years a gap in the, in the, in the intergroup literature on, on interventions more broadly. And, and we, we, we worked very, very hard to develop effective interventions, but avoided, most of us avoided the, the motivational aspect. So I would say that 80 or 90% of the existing tested interventions in the intergroup context are interventions that people, that most people in, in, in you know, intense, intense conflict would simply, you know, be motivated to avoid. Not just that they will be unmotivated to join, they will be motivated to avoid. And, and it's true for emotion regulation interventions, to empathy interventions, but also to, all, to, to many other, you know, even to the classic like contact interventions. Contact can be great, but who really wants to meet the other side who wanted to kill them at, a, a week ago? And, 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 you know, we've done some, some recent work on, on, on that issue. We published, just published a paper in American Psychologist on, on the, the idea of motivation in intergroup interventions and the way we should think, you know, right from the start, when we try to de design interventions, both on the, like the content, like what would make an effective, I don't know, empathy intervention, emotion regulation intervention, contact intervention, but also what would motivate people to engage in, in, in that intervention? And I think that it's very much related to the, to the empathy interventions as well. And I think that that captures, there was another question here about what makes people differentially receptive to different empathy interventions is the last question on the list there. Um, and I think that all of your comments spoke to that to some degree. Um, I do wonder, there's, there's another question here that maybe we could take, and then I, if you have questions for each other too, I, I want to make sure we have a few minutes for that close. So this anonymous attendee asked about empathy, not driving action was a point that you raised in your last, uh, in your presentation around, but that people are more driven by anger and des desire for revenge. Could it be the case? Could it be argued that people feeling angry is driven by empathy? Uh, that people only be, become angry because of prior acts of empathy. Um, and I can see the connections to the schadenfreude work here too. In what case then, in which case is empathy then still the precursor to action or is it a competing different mechanism? So I guess it's about the connections between empathy and, and anger and schadenfreude and also forgiveness too, sort of the interconnections between these different components and how they might relate to each other. It's 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 a fascinating question. I mean, I I, I wouldn't say. I don't. It, it, I mean, if I said it this way, so I think that it, maybe it was. I mean, too strong of of of. I mean, I don't think that it would be accurate to say that empathy does not drive action. I think that one of the observations of what I see right now is that when we think about collective action, 
not you know cross social behavior individuals helping other individuals we don't see empathy as as a powerful driver again when when competing versus you know revenge anger etc um it's it's i mean i, I don't i don't have a clear answer to the, to this question I mean, when, when empathy would be a driver of collective action that's an interesting question one thing that no, we have we have some answers to that right i'm sorry sorry no no, no i i thought you were done keep going you know, I'm saying, you know, we have some answers to that in, in you know, the, the identified victim, like, like studies of Ilana Ritov and, and, and others who show that, you know, if you have one specific victim, then people can, you know, channel their, 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 their empathy towards and, and, the, and then maybe engage in action. We have some indications, uh, but, but, but I, I don't have a good answer for that. All right, Kira. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so one question I almost always get is, well, there are other emotions that are important. Why schadenfreude? And, you know, I'm never arguing that other emotions aren't important. It's just that I think schadenfreude matters too. And one thing I've been mulling around is sort of like the functional nature of these emotions. Like, why do we feel empathy and counter empathy in the first place? And if you take seriously that, you know, empathy is part of creating bonds. Like when you feel empathy, you are, you know, forging bonds between people, then it makes sense that empathy might be a broader emotion that then leads to other emotions to have those adaptive outcomes. So it could be, if I'm feeling a ton of empathy for my in-group, that could also then spark anger because I want to remove the barrier, uh, you know, that's in front of my, my in-group member or someone that I'm trying to ally with. But it could also be that I'm just trying to forge bonds and I don't want to engage in such costly behavior. And so like it's a spectrum of I want to form bonds, perhaps with the least amount of effort necessary. <laughs> uh, and I think that we have all those types of relationships, that there are some relationships we're willing to do a lot for and some relationships we're not willing to do a lot for. But the underlying emotion of like empathy might be there. And then it relates to some things I've been thinking a lot about as it relates to like, well, does schadenfreude have a functional uh, like reason for it? And a lot of the literature says no, but I've been thinking, well, maybe it does. It's just the opposite of that of empathy. It breaks bonds. It pushes people away. But in that pushing people away, you forge bonds within an in-group. That's why, you know, the idea of like bullying and, you know, having a collective enemy tends to bring people together. I think when you are expressing empathy, sort of what Aran uh, mentioned, that you can express empathy for the outgroup because then you're not a good in-group member. So this idea of feeling these empathic and counter-empathic emotions and what it leads to like bond formation or who you should be sort of aligning your actions with seems to be a broader thing. I don't know if there's as much research as we probably want there to be, but I think there's something really important there around this, these emotions and what they lead to in terms of other emotions to get at why you felt the emotion in the first place. Yeah, Felipe, that's great. Felipe? Yeah, I wanted to actually ask sort of a question to Sekira and, and Iran. Uh, um, something, uh, because I'm just, I'm a memory researcher. <laughs> I'm just learning about this these topics, right? Um, so I wonder if all the in-group, out-group relationships are created equal. And the reason why I ask this is because um, something that I have encountered in my experience in Colombia, the conflict in Colombia is very complex because it's, it's uh, based mostly on money and land property, and it is a very old sort of conflict. And as a result, there are lots of different in-group and out-group uh, relationships that occur. So you can have victims like civilian victims that are uh, different from paramilitaries, uh, which are different from guerrilla members, uh, mm -hmm. which are different from the government. But you also can have lower socioeconomic status and higher socioeconomic status. So one thing that I have noticed, for instance, and that all of those are relationships of in-group and out-group. But I have seen uh, that it's easier for, say, a former guerrilla member to empathize with the victims that they themselves you know, affected directly. And you can see, like, this is in-group and out-group. This is perpetrator and in-group. 
than it is for, say, an indirect victim, which are people like people in Bogota that 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 didn't really have anyone directly affected, but someone affected. Uh, it's harder for these indirect victims to empathize with the guerrilla members uh, in in the you know in the rural areas. Um, in fact, there is, although the evidence is, the data is a little bit complex, there is some anecdotal evidence to the fact that most people in urban areas in Colombia, which were by, by the majority indirect victims, were more likely to vote no for the peace process, for the plebiscite, relative to direct victims that were like the literally the ones that were getting the direct victims who were more likely to vote yes for the plebiscite. So it is for me, it's very interesting that different kinds of groups and outgroups are more likely to be overcome by empathy relative to others. So I wonder if you have uh, studied that, like which groups are more real, like, uh, what's the word for that? Uh, it is harder for those in-group, out-groups to be bridged by empathy relative to others. Muslim Iran probably actually has actual data but I'll just say my thoughts about that super quickly. I mean, I, I think that there's something really real around abstract representations of pain and suffering and direct experience with pain and suffering. And what you described seems like that big tension. Uh, and that's actually something that I've been circling around even with schadenfreude, that like kind of getting around this idea of like, how can you have perspective taking to understand what the other person is feeling and yet, uh, somehow empathy doesn't come online. And I think that abstract nature of pain is one way. So when Trump got COVID, I remember asking people, hey, uh, how do you feel? And a lot of Democrats were, I love the fact that he has COVID, feels great. And then I said, are you really imagining him coughing and sneezing and you know doing all these things? And then half of them said, okay, well now, now I have empathy. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. And I think in those situations where people are experiencing you know, either violence directly, like I'm kind of thinking of the family members. It's like, I'm feeling it all. I'm feeling both like my own suffering. I'm imagining what other people are suffering. And, and there's a lot of just like emotions and empathy circling around. I just want peace. But the folks who are definitely affected, right? Like they're seeing the pain, but it's not at like, their families are not the ones being held hostage. Like that, just that small level of abstraction, I think allows for, more uh, <laughs> in, like extremism uh, than would be the case for folks who are again feeling feeling both. But that's just my my two cents. Yeah. Uh, very briefly, I'll say that it, it simply takes me back to you know Tashville and Turner and social identity complexity. Uh, so you know our our social identity is composed of many different like you know identification with many different groups. And then there are different overlaps depending on you know, you know the salient of our identities, different identities in different situations. So it's not just, I mean, I don't think that there's any conflict in which there are only two groups. You know, there are Israelis and Palestinians, but there are also Israeli women and Palestinian women that can, can share some, you know, gender-based identity. And there are people who got hurt on both sides of the borders and they share some aspects of their identity. And then the question is really, which aspect of your identity is more salient in which situation and which, which contextual factors really highlight different aspects of our identities. And that's also part, you know, we can think of it as a way to understand the processes, but also as a way to intervene. Right, right. And, that, and if I could just mention that, so I love that that response, Sakira, because a lot of my work has been too in say thinking about um, engaging in counterfactual thinking about self versus engaging in counterfactual thinking about others. And we have several papers, for instance, in which we show that when you imagine how say a uh, middle-aged Latin American would have done in X situation in the United States, my brain behaves more as if it was remembering. Whereas if I ask like, what would a woman in Iran in 1920 would have done at that? It is more like, it behaves more as if it was retrieving semantic information. So um, a lot of the, the, and I love this answer because it seems to me that, and I'm sorry, I'm a memory researcher, but that part of the key is experience. So, so, uh, so you can empathize better and perhaps empathy will become a much better motivator if you actually have a lived experience 
that makes you much easier to generate a mental simulation of what it would be like to be that person that is in front of you. By contrast, if all the elements that you have to create the episodic simulation with is just stuff that you have learned from political propaganda, from the news, or from like the tiny little Wikipedia article that you read right before you started engaging in this task, then your mental simulation is just going to be too far from the stuff that normally moves us, the stuff that normally motivates us. So, so I think that that understand that just living an experience, having you know, knowing, learning more about it is kind of like probably the key for empathy to be a better motivator. Well, this has been a fascinating session. I know we could probably keep chatting for a while. I'm, I'm mindful of the of the time. I think that that's a, a great note to sort of wrap up the discussion too. Like thinking about how can we take. Uh, you know, the points from all three of your talks today and think about how to, you know, try to use some of this work to speak to, you know, experiences and events that are happening in the world around us. Um, I mean, some of there, a lot of questions that are still in the queue here that are fascinating about, you know, I mean, some of them have, some of them have to do with abstraction, you know, like trying to focus on identifiable people as opposed to outgroup more abstractly. Um, Brandon has a nice question about anticipated exhaustion and effort and how to overcome some of those perceived barriers. And I think that it seems like a, a lot of what you, the three of you have just been discussing might perhaps help to offset that to some extent, perhaps trying to see the value and touching base on shared or lived experiences and trying to simulate. Um, And then Sean has a nice, my colleague Sean has a nice question about empathy and anger that I think was captured to some extent in what Kira was saying earlier about how we identify with different groups in complex ways and that may co-facilitate empathy and anger. So yeah, I mean, this has been a fascinating session. Um, I think it, it provides a lot of food for thought. If anybody has any questions for any of our three speakers, um, their details are on the Zoom webinar registration and also on the webpage on the Consortium for Moral Decision-Making's website. Um, thank you all three again. This has been a fascinating and wonderful way to kick off this year's session. Um, and yeah, I, I really appreciate you all being here. Thank you, this was great. Thank you, Daryl, it was great talking to you and it was great meeting you.